Hello, uh, from Johannesburg, South Africa. My name is Mulemo Mwelwa, and I am one quarter of the Climate Collective, a loose grouping of people from around the world who have come together, convened by TJ Demos, uh, to program the, the, the program that you're part of today, um, which is Climate um, Emergency Emergence. Um, as I said, I'm one quarter. Um, I am an artist and uh, arts organizer based in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm joined by um, the rest of the team, uh, Susan Shupley, who is a documentary filmmaker and researcher based in London, um, as well as Paolo Tavares, um, an architect and special researcher. And then, of course, uh, convener TJ Demos, who is a researcher um, and curator and the director of the Center for Creative Ecologies at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and together we've uh, come together to really develop a program that asks a number of questions over the next couple of months for, for the rest of this year uh, that this program forms part of. Um, those questions really engage with um, issues of how we understand climate uh, futures in relation to climate justice, understanding our climate futures, not simply from a position of um, emergency, but also trying to think about what emerges from understanding a history of um, placing these kinds of uh, realities of the contemporary within a historical space of um, colonial extractivist and capitalist histories. Um, our questions, I will read through very quickly, are what reparatory climate futures are necessary once we adopt greater historical sensitivity to socio-environmental emergencies? How might these manifest through new frameworks of ecologies of care and mutual aid? In what way do technologies of sensing not only observe climate transformation, but construct objects of knowledge, science and politics and reimagine relationships with more than human beings? How and why does climate justice require not simply decarbonization, but decolonization? How do the anti-racial capitalist politics of abolition, um, which articulates social justice demands for the end of policing, mass incarceration and militarization more broadly, extend to ecological and multi-species concerns? Um, as a collective, we uh, approached Margarita Mendes as um, a, a friend and um, a sort of co-practitioner of many of those in that circle um, to help us think particularly from the context of Portugal and from Mart specifically um, as a kind of launch pad of having this conversation over the next couple of months. Um, and this was important to us to kind of situate and localize some of these narratives uh, to relate to the very particular context um, that this program kind of emerges from. And with Margarita, we have um, had a number of conversations that really try to think about how do we bring together the kind of contemporary conversation around um, climate change and climate concerns and connect these to um, a broader conversation around the politics of colonialism, Portugal's colonial history um, and continued relations with former colonial territories. Um, and we're really excited about the program together um, we're, we're really interested in the kind of ongoing conversation, um, interested in the ways in which uh, we might kind of explore um, a range of very complex subjects in a way that brings together um, perhaps otherwise sort of underexplored um, connections. Um, I'll end off just by saying a huge thank you to, to Matt and the Matt team for pulling together this event this evening um, and for working with us over the past months. Um, a huge thank you to Margarita for all of the immense work that you've done over the last two months or so uh, preparing this program. Um, and a thank you to all of you speakers today um, and really, really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you to everybody who's joined us this afternoon as well. Uh, Margarita, I think I hand over to you. Thank you, Melemo. Uh, it's great to have you with us. So the Climate Collective has been founded this year by Matt, and uh, it, they will stay present throughout the whole session. And I want to thank also TJ Dimas, Susan Shupley, Paul Tavares, the other members for inviting me for this session today. So working towards a decolonial ecology, this forum brings into discussion matters that are not commonly addressed side by side here in Portugal, nominally the intersection between the legacies of imperialism, conservation practices, and the current extractive rationale behind the energetic projects of the country's program of economic recovery. To address the critical legacies of extractivism, it is crucial to map in terms of its prior origins in systems of soil and resource management, forms of land grabbing and labor dispossession in previously occupied territories, 
enlarging our knowledge about the imprint that imperialist infrastructural projects leave on current ecological policies and social structures is key to understand our response towards the present climate crisis and the current energetic projects and resource management initiatives that lead it. I will just ask if we can mute the Zoom, because I think there's feedback. So we can have some more clarity in the sound. Should I restart or continue? Molemo, are you muted? Yeah, okay. Sounds, sounds better now. Okay, thank you for bearing with this. Margarita. So, Susan. It, it, it's very, very difficult to hear you. Okay, we will pass that information to the technicians. Apologies, all. Yeah, it's like very quiet, so. I think they need to do, resolve that before you continue. Okay, let's do that. Can we test? Um, how does it sound now? It's much louder, but there's a considerable echo. <laughs> mm, okay, I can hear you perfectly, but... You're certainly quite a bit louder. Okay. We're trying to solve it. We have a great team here with us. Peço desculpa a todos por a ambivalência tecnológica que estamos a tentar. And how does that sound now, Susan? It's good. Uh, Mo was one of the grids. <laughs> Maybe everyone should mute besides Margarita, including the grids. Um, okay. And how does that sound now? Can you hear me, Susan? Yeah, that's quite good. That's quite good. Okay, we got sounds. We're ready to continue. Apologies, everybody, for this. It's a year of trying new hybrid formats, and we're just adjusting to that. So expanding further on what constitutes environmental memory, this forum unites researchers and activists operating in the fields of environmental engineering, conservation, and the humanities to introduce their research and testimonies of political struggles from the ground proposing to weave a space of debate between different areas of scientific research and political activism. So we're gonna have two panels of three presentations each of 20 minutes and Q and A's afterwards with a small break in between. Uh, the conversation is in English, I have to say, because it's the language of the collective, who unfortunately don't speak Portuguese, but everything will be archived with subtitles. So this will be a resource for researchers in the future to access the information collected here. So on our first panel, today here with me. Uh, the panel is called Territorial Disputes in Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique and Portugal and foregrounds historical perspectives on agricultural planning, the managing of resources and conservation practices in order to create an axis between contemporary climate injustice and the colonial legacies of environmental policies. So today we have with us journalist and researcher Boventura Monjan from Maputo speaking from Berlin via Zoom environmental anthropologist Joana Roque Pinho, and architect and researcher João Pratruf. And I will introduce the three speakers and then pass the words to our guests. So Bouventura Monjan holds a PhD on post-colonialisms and global citizenship from the SES Faculty of Economics, University of Coimbra. He's based in the Institute of Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies as a postdoctoral researcher and is also a fellow of the International Research Group on Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies of the RLS. His areas of interest and research include agrarian movements, rural politics, food sovereignty, and climate change. He has been involved in agrarian social movements, both locally and internationally, working with the National Peasants Union in Mozambique and the International Secretariat of La Vie Campesina. Our second speaker, Joana Hocht Pinho, holds a PhD by the Colorado State University. She's an environmental anthropologist at the Centro de Estudos Internacionais at ISCTE, Instituto Universitário de Lisboa. 
with East African pastoralists and West African farmers as collaborative researchers. She explores local experiences and understandings of social ecological transformations in conservation landscapes. João Prates Ruivo studied architecture at Technic Lisboa and is currently uh, doing the same PhD as me in the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths University. His research project, Soil Politics, investigates the technical transformation of soils after World War II, in particular the relation between irrigation and colonization. And he is a member of Shonos Environmental Movement, working against intensive agriculture in Alentejo. So I'm going to pass the word to Boaventura. Can you hear us? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Sounds perfect. Great. Uh, thank you, Margarita. I'm very have, um, I can hear feedback, but I think, uh, well, I, I will just continue. I was saying that I'm very happy to, to be in this talk and uh, I want to express my uh, personal appreciation to you, Margarita, for inviting me. Um, um, as you said, I dedicate myself to studying agrarian movements and rural politics, trying to understand power relations between state, capital, and the peasantry in, um, in the global, sorry, in Southern Africa, um, especially uh, in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. So I will, be, uh, I will be talking about the dynamics of extractivism, including agro-extractivism, its impacts, and uh, people's responses to it, focusing on Mozambique. Um, next slide, please. Great. So I argue that in order to understand it, the current wave of extractivism, land and resource dispossession, privatization and the wider penetration of capital in, uh, in the new extractive frontiers in Africa, we need to trace the process and trajectory of capital, uh, capitalist accumulation on the continent. So first, when the African continent came under uh, control of the centers of capitalism, uh, the, uh, the continent was progressively uh, depopulated. Uh, this was followed by a phase of the so-called legitimate trade, uh, which itself uh, aggr uh, aggravated the extent of European domination and, and, and primitive accumulation in Africa. This was the long durée process of capitalist accumulation that later was consolidated through centuries of colonialism. Well, liberation struggles later erupted, independences were gained, and ideologies of nationalism and consolidation of, of, of na na national liberation were, going, were, were gaining traction. At least in Southern Africa, uh, during the uh, nationalist phase, imperialism had come under severe attack in the form of you know, discourses on neocolonialism, underdevelopment, and capitalist exploitation and plunder. So the imperialism had, so imperialism had to be economically vindicated uh, and morally rehabilitated. Uh, that was the task that was accomplished by neoliberalism. So the current wave of extractivism coincides with the deep crisis of capitalism, of neoliberalism, and of extractivism itself. Let me explain this. Uh, if in on one hand, nature can no longer withstand the levels of eco uh, ecological destruction uh, caused by extractivism, whose consequences are seen in rising temperatures, in the various climate shocks that are devastating the world, my own country being one of the uh, you know, more visible victims of it. On the other hand, uh, there are pressures coming from everywhere, forcing a paradigm change in the world's economy to move from fossil fuels to renewables. The role of environmental movements and activists in calling for a post-extractive economy has been very powerful, you know? Leave the oil in the soil, the coal in the oil, and the tar sands in the land. This has been a plea of climate act justice activists for decades. So I use a political economy analysis as a method, um, and I will say that the current ecological crisis was foreseen by Karl Marx as a tendency under capitalism. The metabolic rift is actually Karl, Karl Marx's notion of the irre, irreparable rift in the interdependent process of social metabolism. Marx theorized a rupture in the metabolic interaction between humanity 
and the rest of nature emanating from extractive capitalism. Just as Marx argued um, that the bloody and violent process of expelling peasants from the land generated the preconditions for capitalism, I argue that the current forced transition to non-fossil fuel economy is even more violent for humans and nature since the extractive capitalist forces are in, in a rush to fast track the process of extracting the oil from the soil, the coal from the hole, and the tar sands from the land before they can no longer do so. Next slide, please. Perfect. In my field of critical agrarian studies, we say that agro-extractivism is also uh, on the rise. And this has been triggered by agrarian neoliberalism under the current convergence of multiple crises. Land has been seen instrumentally as a solution to multiple crises. Food, energy, economy, you name it. This has led to the new scramble for Africa through land grabbing, violent evictions, and human rights violations. Next slide, please. So land grabbing also serves other interests beyond the agrarian, such as big conservation projects, big dams, ecotourism, biofuel production, irrigation systems, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Extractivism has a norm uh, leads to genocide, inequality, insurgencies, and as I mentioned before, violence in the Global South. And here the Global South uh, is not, def definitely it's not a geographical South, it's a non-imperial South, it's a geopolitical South, right? To say that there are Souths uh, within the North and North within the South. In my own home, Mozambique, we are dealing with an armed insurgency and conflict that started in 2017 uh, in the gas and resource rich area of Cabo Delgado. As we speak now, more than 700 people have been uh, displaced. More than 3000 people have been killed. Militarization is being intensifying, intensified and the deep humanitarian cr crisis uh, is uh, in place now. These are results of extractivism. Next slide, please. So, uh, there are deep human, social, economic, environmental, cultural, and demographic effects of extractivism, as you can see. Uh, but as you know, where there is oppression, there is also resistance. Uh, there is a living proof that people and communities that are victims of extractivism uh, have not been compliant accomplices, nor have they been passive victims in the face of increasing poverty and marginalization. Instead, they are actively resisting extractivism. Um, as I, uh, I, I hear towards concluding my presentation, I want to talk about an impressive process of resistance, resistance to agro-extractivism in Mozambique, which was a resistance to uh, pro-Savannah. Uh, next slide, please. So pro-Savannah was a proposal by the governments of Japan, Brazil, and Mozambique to replace peasant uh, farming in the Nakala corridor area in central and northern Mozambique by a monocultural intensive model to grow cash crops such as soya beans for exports. It was resisted for almost 10 years by agrarian social movements and the broad agrarian civil society in Mozambique. And it was finally defeated and terminated in 2020. Pro Savannah was targeting an area of about 14 million hectares of land in an area where almost 4 million people live and work the land. Um, I don't need to say how much ecological damage Pro Savannah uh, could have caused if uh, it had succeeded. Well, I was given 15 minutes and I would like to uh, invite you to watch a one minute and a half trailer of a documentary film that we produced together with uh, my friends from Baga Baga Studio, a collective uh, that you know, does impressive uh, audiovisual work based in, in Portugal. 
Uh, we did this film documentary in 2017 in Mozambique on the resistance to land grabbing, but also to Pro Savannah. So uh, I would like you to play this video and uh, um, it, it doesn't take long, it's just one minute and, and a half. <clears throat> Vários investidores estão a entrar na, na zona norte, no corredor de Nacala. Podemos sair agora para uma das comunidades onde estão aí com campo, ir a banhar camponeses lacrimados, camponeses acastados, porque perderam as suas terras. There's great opportunity in Africa. I want to see if we can actually uh, make some progress in concrete terms. A terra é do próprio moçambicano. Mas hoje em dia estamos a ser retirados como porco, como cão. Há pessoas com intenções de nos destruir. Mesmo podem ser moçambicanos ou não, mas há moçambicanos com intenções de destruir-nos entre nós próprios. Tu tens um Estado que durante 20 anos, 30 anos, andou parado e pouco fez para o camponês e hoje vai tirar o único bem que o camponês conseguiu, que foi a terra. Quando queremos colocar essas questões sobre as terras, somos ameaçados. Às vezes não nos deixam. Essa aqui é guerra, a segunda guerra para nós. Agora, quem é que está a dizer a verdade? Flores prostando do chão do seu suor, belos montes, belos rios, pelo mar. Nós choramos por ti, ó oh Moçambique. Nenhum tirano nos irá escravizar. Great. On that note, uh, I thank you for listening to me and for watching this short trailer. Over to you, Margarida. Thank you, Boaventura. Thank you. So I pass the word to Joana Hockping, our next speaker. And the presentation of Joana, please. <laughs> um, next. Just a minute. Yeah, some minute. Okay, this is working? Yeah. Yes, okay. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm so honored to be here today, uh, out of my comfort zone for several reasons, <laughs> not on Zoom anymore. And um, I, oh, this is very loud, no? Is it okay? Okay. It's okay. okay. And <laughs> thank you, Boaventura. I really enjoyed your talk, and there are some overlaps with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, my story of environmental memory takes place in another Portuguese-speaking country, a former colony of Portugal, Guinea-Bissau. And I was, um, my research takes place in Cantonese National, National Park, actually, I prefer it like this, if it's okay. Um, in, oh, that's, sorry, I need to, 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 to adapt to this. Um, so I have been conducting research in Cantonese National Park, uh, and after several years, in 2014, I engaged a group of um, local farmers, men and women of several ethnic groups and ages, um, as my collaborative researchers through their photography and their storytelling. In fact, they became my research partners in their own rights to document their local perceptions of environmental changes. Here? Okay, sorry. Um, um, to document their um, environmental changes, their perceptions of environmental changes. Oh, and what became clear in this research was, and was uh, somewhat a surprise to me, was that they were presenting me with a, a discourse, a narrative about this protected area that didn't match the discourse of decades of scientific uh, investigations in the area and of the um, actual land managers, uh, mainly some NGOs that were still managing the park at this time. And I credit this, I credit this method of participatory photography to expose this narrative. Because my initial research project uh, was to to focus on uh, local knowledge of the climatic changes. Um, what you see here is a, is a sorry, I need to, this is 
<laughs> I'm a bit uncomfortable in this setting. This is a rice field uh, inundated by extremely high tides and there's a local perception that rains are decreasing and the sea level is rising. And this is really affecting uh, local food security. Um, and I was also in interested in the role that increasingly restrictive conservation policies inside the national park would play in shaping uh, not only livelihoods, but the very understandings of climate change. But this project builds, into a long, uh, builds upon a longer term um, project that I've been carrying out since 2010 on local understandings of these alien concepts uh, right, um, of concert, well, I was interested in what such alien concepts as biodiversity con conservation mean to these local farmers, or even the, the concept of nature, deforestation. Um, <clears throat> and as you will see, this is an area where there have been uh, decades of conflicts across different actors, the farmers, but NGOs, conservationists, even scientists. And my hypothesis is that at the root of these conflicts for access to land and to natural resources could be conflicts of meaning, meanings that people were basically not really speaking the same language. And that these concepts from Western science and Western culture were being imposed on these local farmers. But then after six months, what I had was actually, from my interviews was basically this these concepts were perfectly integrated in the local discourse of farmers, and um, they were all about biodiversity conservation, the forest, and the forest is economically um, valuable to us, but unfortunately we are bad people, we cut the forest, and because of that the desert is advancing and the rain is staying away. So there was almost a perfect match between local, the local discourse of farmers and the discourse in the scientific literature and the NGOs who manage the park and the biodiversity in Guinea-Bissau. So this inspired me for my project on climate change to actually use this very simple methodology, participatory photography, where people use their photography, use cameras to share with the external researcher, me in this case, voluntarily what they want to share. So without removing the process of research out of the, the tension-ridden tension uh, interview context where we try to, kind of, to fool each other a little bit. Um, and then in a second stage, pe people ex explain the meanings in the photographies and that's one way to collect data. It's a decolonizing methodology because the, the um, the objective is to turn the traditional research hierarchy on its head, um, uh, where research subjects actually become the researchers, they are seen as experts, and they have a control of the research process. So theoretically, this is empowering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> But more pragmatically, I guess, I really wanted to deal with the problem of interview fatigue and the fact that people were telling me what they thought this white woman, a scientist come from a research project, wanted to hear about, and which is white people love forests. And so they were really feeding me that. So Guinea-Bissau, very quickly, is a small Western African uh, country, a former Portu uh, Portuguese colony. Um, it's full of uh, islands and water, and this is, uh, I would, this is, sorry, I'm so confused with so many, I don't know, I haven't found which one I should focus on, maybe I should focus on that one. Uh, so this is Emilker Cabral, there, uh, the father of, of Guy de Bissau's independence. And this independence was actually won here in the south, precisely where my research project was going on at the time, in the Kubukare Peninsula. Which, is, which coincides nowadays completely with the border, uh, boundaries of uh, Cantanège National Park. It's, uh, this is the, bound, the border with Guinea-Conakry. Um, it's, it's a very recent national park, gazetted in 2011, NGO managed until 2014, and it's a very special area. It's a very special national park because you have 20,000 residents in there that burn the land, use the land, farm the land, settle the land uh, of more than 10 ethnic groups and three major religions. So it's an extremely, well, like the whole country, extremely diverse area, an interesting area. 
and very interesting in terms of the land tenure and the environmental management. Um, <coughs> the, the Nalu ethnic group are, are considered the landowners of, of this piece of land, the landlords. They, they've been reported there since the 15th century by Portuguese. But the real land, landlords, Donos de Chon, are the spirits, nature, nature spirits called Iranj. And so when guests, uh, Oshpedush, people from other ethnic groups come to Kubukare to ask for land, usually they're always granted the land. Um, by the Nalu landlords that first requested authorization to grant the land from the Iranj, from the spirits. And the Nalu are still widely recognized as the owners of the land. And the other interesting thing is that Nalu have sacred places deep inside the forest, but also everywhere else. You see sacred places almost everywhere, and different sacred places, water springs and so on, have a, a set of rules to to conserve them, basically. So Cantonier National Park, ecologically, it's a mosaic of forests at different stages of development. You, you can see clearly the mosaic here of mangrove, two types of savannas, cultivated fields, orchards, and fallows, shaped and formed by different types of land uses that are complementary and defined along ethnic lines, uh, shifting cultivation, fruit, fruticulture, and three types of rice farming. So it's a place full of people. People travel a lot from a village to another, as well as chimps, which were uh, one of the reasons the park was created. Um, and they, there's quite a sizable uh, population of uh, daddy. Uh, that's how they're, they're known locally. <clears throat> also interesting for a national park, it's also known as the granary of Guinea-Bissau. Because, especially because of this type of land use, mangrove rice farming, uh, an incredi incredibly sophisticated type of land use that depends on people cutting the mangrove and then using rainwater for years and years to de slowly desalinize the soil until the soil is ready for rice farming. It's un incredibly sustainable. Uh, the soil fertility is maintained for 100 years. And this is all done uh, just by muscle strength of uh, people from a local ethnic group, the Balanta. No machines, no animals involved. And this produces excedents of rice. It's incredibly productive. In this landscape, also, you see colonial legacies. And this is where it was really interesting to be invited here because it's, it forced me to think about this colonial infrastructure that is still present in this area and that people tell me stories a lot about. So for example, you have harbors, military installations, uh, pe roads, people talk about forced labor to build the roads, taxation, which um, made people build their villages inside the forests to avoid taxation. Uh, they're still demining ongoing at this point, um, a heritage of the War of Independence. So this area is called the Cradle of Independence of Guinea-Bissau. The most brutal part of this war was fought here, and the war was won in these forests. So the forests are locally cherished also by the cover they provided to the fighters, and the fact that the Nalu opened the sacred forests to the fighters, allowing the spirits to, to support the independence war. But then we also have a very strong legacy of post-colonial, still ongoing development interventions. Starting in the 80s, a local NGO with strong international funding started to fund agricultural development projects. The goal was, although it was participatory development, the goal was to teach the locals to farm in rational ways. So moving them out of intercropping into monoculture, a little bit what um, Boaventura mentioned, although in a much smaller scale. Um, <clears throat> it's a very, there's a very complicated um, political history uh, but of the relationships between the different groups of farmers and this NGO. It's one NGO mainly. Um, but let's say that their intervention over the decades have created um, lots of conflict, tension, political manipulation by local farmers of these projects. And in, ecologically, it has also backfired because people have actually started to cut inside the forest to start to, to plant mangoes in a rational way in monocultures. <clears throat> 
um, in terms of conservation, this area attracted the, the, the attention of the Portuguese who made it a game reserve with hunting restrictions. In the post-independence time as well, a new uh, hunting law brought lots of uh, restrictions even to local hunting inside this area. And then starting in the 80s, in the 90s, as uh, elsewhere throughout the tropics, a concern was growing about the evil slash and burn farmers, right? The shifting cultivators who slash and burn to, to, and destroy the forest to, to grow their food. Locally, concerned about immigrants coming from other countries to also farm with slash and burn. And the market economy, the cash crops, people growing cashew, uh, even though that was at the same time encouraged by the World Bank. Uh, and commercial fishing from Senegal, and so on, and so on. So the usual suspects of tropical land degradation. Starting in the 90s then, um, this concern centered around the primary forests of Cantonese, primary for dense subhumid forests uh, that were deemed to be extremely important because of a very high biodiversity, and deemed to never have been touched uh, by the hand of man thanks to Nalu spiritual protection. So in the 90s, this N NGO together with other NGOs and international funding again, started this initiative to scientifically survey Cantonese. But it was not Cantonese as a whole, the focus was only the primary forests. There was no attempt to survey and map the savannas, the mangroves, which are also uh, important ecologically. Following this, there was a zoning attempt. So the area, the forests were divided in three zones, uh, one of them being uh, an inter inter integral reserve that people were not allowed to use in any means and to engage local people as volunteers to protect their forests. Then came the civil war, um, and this project was stopped. In, the, in 2000, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature revived the initiative and focused again on primary forests. Underlying all these efforts um, is this discourse, which has been analyzed by a Portuguese political ecologist, Marina Tumud, which he calls the environmental degradation narrative. So this publication, for example, from the NGO that, that was behind this uh, conservation initiative, summarizes the scientific findings at the time. So this is already a bit old, from 97. But when you read some of the scientific publications, you also get this idea that the, these forests are fragments of a, a big forest that was continuous and extensive. The, so those are islands that, that somehow have survived the greed of humans. They're relics, they're going extinct, and we must act now or never, or in 10 years, the fo 10 years which was 10, 10 years ago, there, won't, there wouldn't be forests in Cantonese right now. Uh, and these few remaining giants are the last protection against the all-advancing desert. So this discourse, uh, on one hand, instrumentalizes, uh, because it's also very focused on the sacred forest, so completely in instrumentalizes the Nalu sp uh, spiritual beliefs. And to me, always sounded like fetishes, uh, <laughs> turning the forest into a fetish, right? Uh, and here I must issue a disclaimer. After, after spending so much time inside a forest here, I've become a savanna person. <laughs> I really love savannas. Not so much forest anymore. Um, okay, but this discourse is still pre present uh, in the internal regulation of the park. And again, this idea of one big forest covering the whole of Guinea-Bissau. And that is just decreasing and decreasing and decreasing because of people's greed. Uh, which, and it makes also the northernmost um, primary forest of Africa. Um, oh, sorry, I wanted this elsewhere, but it's okay, I'll just move on. So the, pr the prescribed solutions to these challenges of conservation are, and you can see a huge list of prohibitions that over the years people are no longer allowed to practice their what they used to do traditionally in order to be able to farm this land, like burning and, and um, collecting some plants and so on, and hunting also. 
so the solutions, the prescribed solutions are of course based on, on the primacy of scientific um, knowledge and research, territorialization and repression, and you will see the type of repression, in simultaneous with this win-win narrative of co-management and people gaining benefits from ecotourism. And this also involves a lot of education, environmental education, which is known as sensitivization locally. I was part of some of these meetings with the villagers in 2011, because the park was expanding towards the north, uh, towards the territory of an ethnic group that is traditionally uh, evil because practicing uh, shifting, sh shifting cultivation and burning and so on, and they had to be taught the new rules. And the new rules were not entering easily, ov obviously. And this, this is a meeting with staff from the NGO together with uh, this person from the Forestry Government Agency. And I was flabbergasted to hear this, that the, from this uh, NGO person, so from a non-governmental organization, saying, after God, the state, and we represent the state. And today we come here to show you the correct path forward. So the discourse hasn't changed since the 80s. We still have this top-down authoritarian approach to development at the time, now to conservation. And a, f a few weeks later, um, I was in this other meeting uh, with the same NGO, the forestry guy, the local king, and villagers uh, from, all, all from the Fula ethnic group. And they were protesting against some, something that had happened, which was a young farmer uh, was caught by this patrol of NGO staff and the forestry guy farming in the forest, and he was undressed at gunpoint, humiliated, beaten, uh, tortured, as they put it, in the name of conservation. And again, this is a part of the park where the rules were just being implemented. People were not understanding the rules. And another time, uh, around this same time, actually before this, I went on patrol with that group of people, and we came across an elderly couple of migrants who were just harvesting their little rice yield um, inside the forest. And these guys basically uh, reprimanded them, took the rice, stole the rice from them, and left them absolutely desperate. So I shared this over beers in Bissau to somebody, uh, who, who, an employee of the International Union of the Conservation of Nature, and again, I was flabbergasted to hear that, well, you know, that's the way it is. Violence is the only language Guineans understand. So I'm giving you this long background just to contextualize what follows uh, and to explain why you have this, this uh, deployment of the white narrative about the park by the locals because I'm white, I, I, I'm a scientist, I, I belong to a project, I'm also a tourist, I'm also an NGO in their minds. So they, as white people, they will tell us, no, everything is fine and we love the forest. But actually, these conservation policies really, really affect their livelihoods and their lives. So fast forward to 2014, this is Kafal, uh, the village where I did my project focused on climate change. This was a very important base for in the independence war for the freedom fighters. Uh, Nino Vieira, former president of Guinea-Bissau, was based here. And this is one of the first days of training in photography, uh, both technical and ethical uh, training, some of the photographers, so men and women, three ethnic groups, youth and elders. Um, and so people went about their lives as usual, and they would just take pictures whenever they felt like it of whatever they wanted to tell me, teach me about environmental changes from their perspectives. And then regularly we would sit down for storytelling sessions where people would explain the meanings of, or of their photographs. And finally, this, this is the final step, and it was a an initiative of the photographers, they organized a closing ceremony to share their stories and their, and their pictures with local policymakers, including the police, the, par the park administration. So at this point, the park was no longer managed by the NGO, but actually managed by the state. And the new director was actually quite a nice person. Um, and other communities, and they were extremely proud to tell their stories. 
which I will share in a minute. So this is the, our eldest photographer telling one of his stories. Uh, the pictures were screened on the wall of the local disco. So now I'm going to confront the stories and the pictures and narratives of my collaborators with three propositions of the of the external discourse on, the, on this area. So one of them, as we mentioned, is that primary forests are disappearing. Well, uh, Moussa Conté, this photographer, decided that, no, the, my picture, my story, is about the fact that the forest is eating the savanna. The forest is making the savanna disappearing. And it's actually really beautiful. You see, on the, you see here the forest, you see here the savanna, the lala, and here you see the mangrove. So it's a perfect picture. And to him, he attributes these changes, uh, the fact that the forest is actually increasing to changes in the hydrological regime. So needless to say, you don't find this in the dominant narrative about this area. And I've been told about this fact, the fact that the forest is increasing in some places by going for walks, um, but I could never, of course, really identify it myself. And why? Why is this a problem for locals, the fact that the savannas are disappearing? Uh, for one reason, because that's how they thatched their roofs, and the thatch grass is, is, is becoming increasingly rare. Also, because the park prevents the burning, which usually regenerates it. So this is leading to people having to spend a lot of money and trouble to to cover their houses with zinc roofs. So in this national park, you have more and more zinc roofed houses. So hardly the traditional image that the park management would like to give. Also for locals, the savannas are actually richer in medicinal plants than the forests. That also doesn't fit the narrative, right? And, um, and but the fact that, the, that they're telling me that the forest is increasing, there is some remote sensing evidence towards that. And then another big one is that farmers like environmental consciousness, and that's why we need to teach them to value economically the forest and so on. I will start with this very cute story of this freshwater lake uh, in, the, um, in the rice farming area. Um, <clears throat> and Albatiala, the photographer, told me that as kids they would play in here and they would find little crocodiles that they wanted to kill and the elders would tell them, you are totally forbidden to, from kill the, killing these crocodiles. And so the story goes that years ago, uh, an elder found a baby crocodile, put it in there, and then the crocodile went to the big river, got married, brought back his children, and then you had uh, a big population of crocodiles in this little lake. And Albat, the photographer, told me over time, these crocodiles became sacred, so we don't even think of killing them. And this is all because an old man liked wild animals, as he told me. The next story is a story of cutting trees. We have a poilan, one of the most majestic um, trees in the, in the park, extremely protected, also protected by the Nalu, the, frequently the houses of spirits. And traditionally, you had to ask the Nalu for permission to cut it to make a canoe, for example. So the poilau is here. There's a big decomposing trunk of a big poilau. And then the owner of this poilau put a seed in the decomposing trunk, and now you have a new poilau. So you cut a tree, you seed another one. The next photographer also told me that he was surprised to arrive at this, um, the backyard of the, this local farmer and to see six of these big trees planted in, in rows. And I, he said, I asked the owner, why, why, why do you have these trees like this? Well, it's my father. He thought, let me, let me plant these trees because they might become uh, valuable in the future. And again, these are forest trees, right? Not agricultural trees. But the best example is this plantation of Sib, uh, a local tree in, in Guinea-Bissau that is extremely valuable for, for construction. And people also make wine. The problem with making wine is that it kills the tree. And it's extremely protected. It gives you jail time in Guinea-Bissau if you cut them in any way. And the old man who is the owner of this, this is a former Bulanya, which had lost his uh, fertility. And he decided, let me plant these seeds because they're so expensive, they're so valuable. Um, so he planted hundreds of them. It's unbelievable. I, I've seen this place. I'd never heard of it. 
Um, and as the photographer said, this old man planted not for him or his children, he planted for thinking of his great-grandchildren because to reach maturity, these trees take 70 years. So it's really long-term thinking. And this is the old man, the innovator. <laughs> and in general, uh, now we have lots of stories and pictures of people protecting trees, planting them. Uh, this is in the middle of Kafal. Uh, this village particularly liked his trees. Um, this man, well, maybe you don't see it very clearly, but these are seedlings, and this is a tree nursery. And this shower place, and I've taken many showers in these places, is also a tree nursery. So showers are used as tree nurseries. The water goes to the ground, and you have the little seedlings all over you when you take a shower. It's really wonderful. And finally, there's also um, <clears throat> the last proposition that Cantenier somehow has a wild character. It's pristine, it's primary forests, places that are remote, never touched by, by humans. So this looks pretty wild, right? And, but for the photographer, this is a village. This is the original village of Kafal, in the time when it was inside the forest to avoid taxation by the Portuguese. And what we are seeing, almost all of this, is fruit trees, mango trees, orange trees, really tall, and somewhere, kola nut trees. And these trees mark uh, the places um, of former villages inside the forests, and they produce fruits that the chimps and lots of other animals, wildlife, actually enjoy and love. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I love this picture because this is a picture about uh, land tenure uncertainty, which also happens here in part because of those developments, interventions, lots of rumors that land is going to be privatized and we need to privatize it before it's grabbed. And so people are planting trees also to claim the land and this old man planted this bougainville uh, and that made for a really beautiful picture. And another favorite uh, of uh, story, together with stories of the founding of villages, is the founding of water, water sources. People would dug out these water springs in the forest. They're named, they have owners. Some of them have spirits, so they couldn't be photo photographed. As, but there's a spiritual protection of most of the water springs. People are not allowed, to, for example, to wash their bodies there, so to prevent pollution, basically. Um, so again, people really can locate and name every single water spring in this landscape. And what we see here is the remain of uh, initially a Portuguese store, um, later on in the hands of a, of a local man who died in the 90s, and so the store became a ruin and people regret the fact that they can no longer commercialize their products there. <clears throat> and the photographer mentioned that these trees were actually planted by the Portuguese manager at the time. So lots of tree planting by people. <laughs> and finally, burial sites are also very important in this landscape. And this is the burial of an um, independence war hero, a local teacher that died while being bombed by the school, while the area was being bombed by the Portuguese. So he took me in the forest at night to see this burial site. So yeah, hardly primary forests, right? <laughs> um, so to conclude, and sorry for this very long background, but to conclude and summarize, so there's the dominant discourse about this area, uh, very focused on primary forests that ignores the importance, economic and ecological importance of mangroves, savannas, leave alone the importance for local people. Uh, a discourse, catastrophic discourse based on fragmentation, extinction, degradation. There's urgency in solving the problem and you need to use scientific knowledge and to teach people about the importance of these forests. This discourse is also entangled with development and conservation politics, very complex ones. Uh, they're entangled with violence and conflict, as we saw, but they're also locally appropriated and strategically deployed by by local farmers. But in this, with photography, and it's, it was so simple, uh, but it's been decades of research, and frankly, I've not seen most of these alternative stories come up in interviews, for example. 
there's this alternative image of this landscape as being very historical, complex, diverse, dynamic. It's changing uh, for ecological reasons, not just driven by human greed. And it's also positively shaped by local management and conservation practices like the tree planting, like the protection of the water springs. But also, even the colonial history, even the colonial ruins, the, or water springs, um, well, human traces in the landscape are deeply valued by the locals. I was, that was the biggest surprise for me. Uh, most pictures are actually about human remains, human traces in the landscape. So there's a locally valued uh, cultural heritage. So this is a very humanized landscape, and that's not what you get, get in the literature on this, on the landscape. And was also exposed in this, in this research, very rich but subaltern uh, ecological knowledge that is not valued and is actually silenced, made invisible, ignored and denied by the, by the scientific, uh, well, let's say by the external discourse on this area. So to finish, actually, this was very interesting. A month after leaving the, uh, leaving the park, uh, the director, the Bissau Guinean director, told me he put together um, a scientific project to promote the cultivation of SIB. But what is interesting is that this initiative was completely inspired by the story of the old man who planted SIB for his great-grandchildren. And also, uh, the recent park management plan no longer mentions primary forests, so that stereotype is gone. I think that's good. So thank you so much for your patience and attention, and thank you to the photographers. Thank you. <sighs> it's a very long Now we have uh, Jean Rue. Sound is okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you, Margarida, and the Climate Collective, wherever you are, for for this invitation. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure to be here and and to speak about parts of my my research, which I'm conducting for my PhD um, at the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths. So my research is entitled uh, Soil Politics, and it deals with the techno scientific transformations of soils. In particular, uh, in the context after the Second World War, uh, so I'm looking into uh, the, the making of uh, 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 a world soil map by FAO, uh, an organization uh, from the United Nations dedicated to uh, the development of industrial agriculture. And what I'm trying to understand is how this um, uh, and it's 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 um, the transformation of, uh, um, of the industrial uh, apparatus uh, of war after the Second World War is turned into um, agri the agriculture, uh, the mod modern agriculture, mainly in two, uh, uh, two main components, one being uh, mechanical, so uh, how tractors became, uh, sorry, how tanks became tractors, and the other being chemical, so how explosives are turned into uh, fertilizers and so on. So there's a, a an industrial redeployment which basically turned the war machine into an agricultural uh, machine. So I'm looking to these transformations, the post-war, from the perspective of, uh, of the making of, uh, of a world soil map, which basically uh, uh, does uh, a number of things. So it, it, it not only um, uh, uh, asked for, for uh, uh, countries and states in the post-war to, to contribute with new surveys, so soil surveys, uh, it also um, proposed that there will be a new uh, common uh, taxonomy, a, cl a classification system, which would make uh, a uniform kind of different, <laughs> echo, different soil classifications that existed prior. So basically that all the soil scientists of the world could speak the same language. So in that process, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm really interested in is the way in which uh, the, the, this the translation of the classifications of, uh, uh, of soils also gave, uh, in turn, kind of transformed the soil itself. So kind of the, all the soils, uh, in, in the way in which they, they had to belong to, uh, to this new taxonomy, they were also, so there's never, there's never the actual thing. So the, 
there's no such thing as, uh, as the perfect sample. So basically every sample from that moment on would be either deficient or in excess of certain nutrients. And in particular, uh, what, was interest, uh, what FAO was interested in was to, um, uh, to judge. So, so the analysis of soil were basically trying to understand that what would be um, uh, the quantities of, of particular nutrients that were essential for cultivation. So the, so the famous uh, uh, NPK um, equation, which uh, is at, at the core of, uh, of industrial agriculture and of the Green Revolution, which is nitrogen, potash, and uh, azote. So this, these kind of three components, uh, uh, their presence in soil. So every soil will be sampled against its uh, excess or deficiency in one of these components. So this, um, so what I'm looking into is the way in which the survey became uh, a tool for the transformation of soils, and, and in, uh, in that way, uh, the, the surveys are also um, uh, for forming part of, of the beginning of a, a, a sort of infrastructure. So the, leg the colonial legacy of, uh, of the soil surveys is in, in, in the present is an, uh, an invisible in infrastructure um, of, uh, uh, of this um, uh, new taxonomy of soils. So I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, at this profound transformation through the perspective of, uh, uh, of the colonial uh, uh, soil surveys in, uh, that were made by the Portuguese government. Uh, in the post war uh, so this the, the image here uh, is, are these images are collected from uh, ISA, uh, the institut superior de agronomia so the Ag agronomic uh, institute uh, uh, in lisbon uh, and this space so these these are the collections i, I cannot really point with the laser because it's a screen uh, but i <laughs> maybe a stand up so these uh, the spaces uh, Basically, the, the space is called the Pedoteca, so it's a library of soils, it's, and it's the archive of all the samples that were collected uh, from the period of from 46 until 74, until the end of, uh, um, of the fascist uh, state, and also the, uh, one year prior to the independence uh, of the colonized territories. And what, what, what the space does, so at, in, during that period of, of the surveys, it, it operated as a kind of lab, so it, it's an archive of soils, and it's an academic lab for the university. In the present, it serves as a sort of library educational, um, uh, educational uh, apparatus uh, to, to teach students about soil differences, but it's still, uh, what is really remarkable, it, it, it still displays um, uh, an image of, of this attempt to, to have an overview, a synoptic overview of the empire. So it's, it's a profound, uh, uh, um, it, it's 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 the ima the this imperial image which is basically uh, obsessed about the way that you can quantify and, and identify uh, the the colonized subject uh, in all its aspects. In this case, uh, the subject is is the soil. So these these are some images of uh, both of the of these uh, uh, long uh, these long monoliths uh, which were extracted. There are not many of the, of those. Uh, so the main the main component. Uh, the biggest number is, uh, is actually the actual samples, which are taken. So that's the one in the jars that you see in the, in the image above. And there are above 60,000 of those jars with soil samples. So they're taking at three different uh, heights uh, of a soil profile. And they are then tested uh, in the lab back in the metropolis to understand uh, the presence or deficiency of, uh, of nutrients. So you can see uh, uh, in, in this close-up of, of, of this kind of synoptic view of, uh, uh, of the surveys in the, in, the, in the image of the samples allows for um, uh, a juxtaposition uh, uh, of, of this illusion of, uh, of imperial control over the colonized uh, territories. So I'm, what I'm, what I'm uh, interested in now is to understand also so what, what, is, what is the role of, uh, uh, of, of the scientific surveys uh, apart from providing scientific information about qualities of soils. And of course, uh, and I'm looking at the specific case uh, um, of Angola, which is the, uh, the ter territory where the Portuguese conducted uh, uh, the highest number of surveys and collected uh, samples. Uh, sorry, I have, I have a bunch of papers in front of me, and it's, it's difficult to, <laughs> to keep track of, of precise information uh, without a table. But in the case of Angola, there were, I believe, 60,000 at, at, the, at the library, there are 65,000 uh, samples and, uh, and um, 63 of these monoliths. So this is an image of uh, the extraction 
uh, of a soil uh, monolith, which from then on you can also understand. So there's two components. One, the monolith that then becomes an image of the soil, and it's extracted vertically. So, uh, so each point in the map basically uh, has uh, vertical information to the depth of uh, one and a half meters. And then you can see also in the bottom small images how at, at hit at three different uh, heights, so the so-called horizons of soil, you also extract a sample. So these kind of different samples give you the information of, uh, of the different properties and qualities of soil uh, in depth. So what's happening here, and for me, I think it's, uh, it's quite important, in, uh, especially for my research, to understand the difference between soil uh, and, and land. So land being a concept which is normally used uh, politically to understand uh, dispossession, uh, land grab, so all, all these terms that come attached to land. And when you move into a, a definition of soil, you understand the, the, the depth of, uh, of the phenomenon. And you also understand so an, a number of things that between the surf, surface and the verticality of a soil profile. So the, the, there, is a diff, there are different forms of dispossession, destruction, violence, which are attached to the concept of soil and the way that it operates uh, uh, vertically, not only, and, and it's not fully linear because this will be dependent also on uh, the consequences of uh, different types of cultivation, the exposure of the top layer with, will allow erosion, so on and so on. So there's a, a number of workings uh, of soil which are totally, uh, I, I, would, I, I would agree with the word metabolic, so it's really a metabolic process uh, which is taking place. And for that, you re it's really important to understand that relation between the surface of the map, so the idea of uh, of a survey, which then gets translated into, you see very small, <laughs> uh, in, the, in the bottom right corner, is uh, the, the outcome of the surveys of Angola is uh, uh, a soil map of the territory of Angola, which then got incorporated in, into the world soil map according to, to the taxonomies of FAO. But to understand that relation between the surface map and, and what, what, and I'll go back really quickly to the first image, and what this means in terms of the taxonomy, is that each one of these colors in the map is actually a has a lot of attributes which are vertical. So this is a really uh, important aspect for me to understand how, how soil behaves and what the transformations of soil uh, that they need to be understood in a vertical uh, sense and not only through uh, mapping. In the in the library, also you can see the, the direct uh, how, how the surveys are directly applied in that particular period, which uh, is the post-war. And there is a shift uh, in, in the modes of governance in what the, the, the Portuguese uh, Estado Novo, the dictatorship, is trying to do is to, to change the mode, um, the mode of governance uh, into becoming a, a settler colonial state. So for that, for that reason, what you have is that the surveys are playing a role in allow, so the mapping of the territory will give information into the particular properties and qualities of, of land for the settlement, uh, the direct settlement of Europeans. So you see here uh, in the, in the, on the right of the image, uh, on this image, you see one, uh, one map which is now an, uh, an historical artifact in the library. But the map is basically Carta de Ptidon para Rigadio, so a chart for uh, uh, irrigation aptitudes of, of land. So it's giving you, uh, an, and the legenda basically gives you kind of, it, it qualifies land according uh, to, to its possibilities, what, what the Portuguese scientists thought would be the most fit lands for, for intensive cultivation and for the, uh, for the arrival of, uh, of white settlers. So from, from, this, uh, uh, from these charts and, and from uh, so what we can, we can understand as a conclusion from the, sur the role of the surveys is that it's basically, so the idea of mapping uh, uh, of course, there's never a, a, a political neutrality, especially if you're talking about a, a fascist colonial state. But in this case, it really puts into question, uh, I interviewed uh, soil scientists at work in the, in the archive, and I, and I asked them about, about, um, about the spear. Some of them had, had been in touch with some of the scientists that conducted the surveys, and they're always very, scientists are always very keen to, to kind of separate the waters. So on the one hand, you have politics, on the, on the other, you have science, so this is a typical scientific trope, uh, but it's really at, at the very core of their, uh, of their work and of their operations. They're basically providing tools. They're, they're really creating the instruments that would allow for an intensification uh, of colonization. In, in this case, an attempt uh, for a late uh, settler colonial project that never really 
uh, took off because 10 years later you have the beginning of the anti-colonial struggles. Uh, and there's a really interesting, uh, for me, intersection between uh, the work of, uh, of soil scientists and soil surveys on, on the ground and the beginning of the struggles and the way that these kind of choreographed according to the soil scientists and, and to some of the uh, uh, liberation fighters in their testimonies saying that there was a, somehow a mutual respect for, uh, uh, for, for the work, the idea of that the scientists are protected because their work will be valuable for a future independent state. So whatever they will do, it will contribute to a knowledge of the terrain and that will be used uh, in, the in, the, in the future nationalist uh, uh, liberation project. But in reality, what happens is that you, you can also understand how these, uh, how these samples are uh, also an image. Uh, they're somehow photographing that, that, that choreography of uh, on the ground between the forces, the liberation forces, and, and this work of soil scientists. So they're also an image of the war in, in the sense that they're taken, uh, alpha, not all of the samples, but some of them are taken in the period between 61 and 74, which is the period of the liberation struggles. So there's a number of really uh, interesting intersections between soil science and the anti-colonial struggle in Angola. Uh, I'm, I'm looking, so one, one last, last point on, uh, on this work and understanding, what, what, so what is irrigation doing? Uh, in relation to soil science. So I'm really happy to speak here in, the <laughs> in MAT, the Museum for Electricity and what is it called? Arch architecture and Technology. something, yeah. Uh, within, uh, so this idea that, um, a, a little disclaimer, so my father worked for this company, for ADP, for the electricity company. I grew up visiting dams and I always really valued dams as, as infrastructures, uh, as physical structures and the idea of the dam so of, uh, as being an ecological uh, technology, so the production of electricity and so on. So that entire narrative uh, that really connects uh, um, irrigation and, and a certain idea of ecology. But we, I think what we can realize from uh, the way that agriculture is developed in a post-war industrial agriculture is that in reality the, the technologies of agriculture are really fueling, the modern technologies of agriculture, are really fueling further and further uh, phenomenon of dispossession, uh, this uh, population displacement, and basically uprooting. And in a sense, all of these, uh, uh, these experiments in the 50s, which preceded the anti-colonial struggles, will be really important for the Portuguese state in the way that they conduct the war, uh, trying to prevent the independence of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Angola, Guinea-Bissau, and Mozambique. So the main thing being a policy uh, for uprooting populations, so the displacing and regrouping of, uh, uh, of local populations uh, in a way to prevent the advance of the army, to make it more legible. So I think James C. Scott will be the, the, the kind of the good source to read uh, about to, the way these, uh, 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 these technologies of war operate. But in here in particular, so what I'm interested in is, is the way that these soil surveys provided basically the map for the military uh, uh, to, to, to regroup populations, so giving the better land uh, what they consider to be the better land for white settlers and leaving what, what, what was thought to be the poor land, so resettling uh, the locals in the, in the poorer land. So all of these scientific, the so-called apolitical scientific maps of soil surveys and land are basically uh, an image of... Uh, they're providing a picture of the, of the territory for military intervention that would come a decade later. So this one, uh, one page is about uh, uh, one, uh, one case study that I'm looking at and I'm, I'm really interested in maybe post-pandemic to, to, to visit uh, because it's difficult to organize any type of field work currently outside of our, our territories. But it's the, colonnade, uh, uh, the former colonnade of Sela uh, in the region of Panza Sul uh, in Angola. So these are images from the first wave of, uh, uh, of settlement in the 1950s, together with maps that, that ex explain or try to uh, uh, provide a, a, a rationale uh, for a strategy of, uh, of white European settlement uh, in Angola, based on the idea that irrigation will al allow for, uh, for the arrival of, uh, of uh, white settler families uh, that would uh, transform the land with their labor and thus uh, uh, also transform the racial composition uh, of the colonized countries. So to be a gradual process of assimilation through the arrival of, uh, uh, of white settlers. So there is a, a, 
and, and my, my interest here is to understand, and this and ends the title of, uh, uh, of, uh, of my intervention today, which is Liquid Desert. So want to understand the role of water in providing a, a, an instrument for, uh, for these transformations, but also to, uh, to realize from this example from the 50s, how the, uh, through the transformation of traditional practices of agriculture to irrigation practices, what, you actually, what the, actually was achieved is the destruction of the properties of soil through a very complex, uh, uh, which I, I have, I, have <laughs> I prepared some reading, but I guess I'll, I'll maybe skip that and try to do it from, uh, from heart. But the way that what, so, so two things, that the draining of, uh, of these soils that were considered fertile, uh, and there's, sorry that the images are really uh, small in this, uh, in this screen, but in some of these images, you, the, there were pictures of the draining, so the mechanical draining of the soil. That was the first step uh, uh, that the, the settlers considered essential uh, for a new type of cultivation. And what that draining did was basically to kill the, uh, the organic top part of the soil, so kind of to, dr uh, to dry it. And that for, uh, then on allowed for, for erosion uh, to take over, plus the way that you know, the, 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 type, the type of farming is totally in inadequate uh, to the type of soil. And so another, another uh, really interesting aspect is the way that some of the soil scientists are actually recommending that this, these soils and these lands are not, not good for, for, uh, for irrigation, but it was, in, in the end, a political uh, decision. And so here are the words of uh, one of the uh, administrators from the government at the time. So he says that the settlement uh, is, is an immediate function of the water that irrigates, raises, and multiplies small-scale property stabilizing the dwelling and within it the family. So these, th these words are, are really uh, uh, in line with, with the, ideo the fascist ideology of, uh, uh, of Stadnov, of the, of, uh, is, there, is there a translation for Stadnov? No. <laughs> the new state, I mean, I hate to say this, it's disgusting. But uh, the, so the fascist government basically uh, uh, in Portugal for, for 40 years, uh, the idea that what, you need, what needed to be prevented at all costs was collectivization. So uh, the, the great fear was, uh, uh, was communism, uh, and, and communism for, for the fascist state was something that basically was growing when people get together. So the only solution for, against communism was to separate populations the most as they could. And one way was, so there, there was uh, coloniza set, directed settler colonization was one of the means uh, to prevent that people would actually live together in collective buildings, they would work in factories. So what, what the state wanted was uh, a return to a kind of rural imaginary where families would, uh, would farm their own land, so small-scale property, uh, and a separation, a, a certain closeness, but also a, a, a very important separation between these, uh, these small farms that were called uh, and now the name is skipping me, uh, Casal. So they're called couple uh, in Portuguese. So the unit of exploration is a couple. So it's really, everything really is really intertwined uh, with an ideology, uh, a very conservative ideology, uh, which uh, tries to do a, a number of things at the same time. So to, to create a sense of, uh, of belonging, which is connecting, sorry that this, this might become a little bit mystical, but that's how, the, that's how the fascist state operated, but trying to connect an idea of religion, a respect for religion and the state, uh, with a sense of, of, uh, uh, of belonging uh, to, to a family unit and to a small community. So this idea of small community is really important in this ideology. And for, the, for this uh, uh, Trig Muraj, the, the, govern, the, the person from the government, what he's saying is that, that the essence of that is water, and it will be water and irrigation that will allow for, for these families to flourish uh, in, uh, in so-called desertic, uh, deserted uh, landscapes. So what, what they're also trying to do, so it's, it's a number of things. On the one hand, the fact that the, the soils are deemed not suitable for irrigation also served uh, the arguments uh, uh, of the colonial uh, uh, government, because they basically argued that uh, it's because the, um, the soil is not uh, cultivated to its most potential, right? So only the settlers, only the colonial government will be able to transform these unfertile soils into the fertility which is in line uh, uh, with, with the colonial project. So there is a number of things that it's, it's never seen as a failure, right? So everything is possible to be, to be overturned into becoming an, uh, an argument for, 
increasing uh, colonization. And in this case, what it also allowed, so and now I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to map out the, the, uh, the next, my next move, which basically to understand how the fact that, you, that uh, Portugal is sending uh, families uh, to Angola as settlers is also an attempt to empty out uh, what was going to be an excess of people in the metropolis. So there, there's, a, there's different dispossessions and uprootings taking place in different territories. So both in Portugal, these people are being uprooted and they're being sent over. And this in turn uh, causes new uprooting operations in Angola. So there's this, these uh, uprooting uh, strategies are connected across territories. So this is, I think, really important to understand. Because the way uh, uh, that, and now I'm, I'm jumping to, to the second part of my, um, my intervention, which is related to uh, uh, a, a, a closer territory at hand, which is Alentejo, and the way that intensive cultivation uh, is playing a role in the destruction uh, um, of an ecosystem, but also uh, water is helping to, to basically depopulate and uproot uh, uh, lar large uh, numbers of, uh, of the population in the south. So I'm, I've been working uh, uh, since a number of years of my research uh, in Alentejo. So an, a second disclaimer is that my family uh, is from Alentejo, so I, 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 I didn't grow up uh, uh, in Alentejo, but I, I spent large parts of my, my childhood uh, over there. I have family and, and, and friends, and I go often. And over, over the recent years, so this, sorry, this previous image is, uh, is an aerial, uh, semi-aerial view uh, of, uh, of the large-scale dam of Alqueva, which many of you might know if, if you live in Portugal or you know Portugal. So it's, Alqueva is a project that took, I believe, 30 years to be finalized. Um, and it promised uh, to, to bring water to a very dry uh, landscape. But basically what, what it's producing nowadays, uh, it's the largest um, uh, artificial uh, dam uh, lake uh, in Europe uh, currently. And it provides 75% of its water uh, to, for intensive cultivation uh, practices. So through this uh, uh, dam and through, the, through water arrives a, a totally new uh, model of, of, uh, uh, of land exploration, which is having really terrible uh, ecological consequences uh, in Alentejo. And for, and for the ones interested in working uh, uh, against intensive cultivation, the, the main issue now is to understand how the, the consequences of the process will only be understood in the next 10, 20, 30 years, and they're not totally visible now. So there's, a, there's really a huge uh, uh, work to be done, I, I believe, at the moment, in trying to kind of not only project uh, the effects of ecological destruction, but to, to in that sense also to raise uh, local awareness uh, to prevent that destruction to happen. So it's, it's, really, it's really a complicated process. So I'm working for, for a number of, of years um, in, in my research project to understand these transformations, but also to, uh, it most importantly, to how can we turn uh, observations, not different types of knowledges, uh, some scientific, some non-scientific of the territory into uh, a form of action and, and of struggle. And currently I'm, I'm uh, uh, part of a, a collective called uh, Show Nos, Movimento Show Nos, which is organized in, uh, uh, in Alentejo, and it's, uh, all, all the members are uh, people that, that uh, reside, not, not all of them are from, it's not that a matter of being or originally from Alentejo, it's not about origins in a sense, but there are people that, that um, uh, live in Alentejo, in this region, uh, and they, they, they want to keep living there. So it, it's, it's a resistance against uprooting and against the desertification uh, of the land. And also against uh, 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 some notions of, uh, of preservation of, uh, of the territory, which are, are, are foreign to that territory. And that would basically call for uh, a preservation of traditional forms of, uh, of agriculture, of practice, etc. Uh, and uh, so the movement in instead tries to argue for uh, how can we maintain uh, uh, modes of life in Alentejo, which might be different. Some might, might involve different types of technology, and even in cultivation. But to understand the role of intensive cultivation and irrigation uh, in the uh, kind of increasing uprooting uh, uh, of populations. So it's, it's, it's a rather complex situation, not different from many other 
cases that, that have happened across the world uh, since the uh, so-called Green Revolution took over in, in the 1960s, and that will be a, a whole other conversation that, that will take longer. So I'm, I'm in my work, I'm, I'm inspired by, uh, by the practice of Amilcar Cabral from Guinea-Bissau, uh, not, not so much the, 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 the freedom fighter, but more the agronomist. So Amilcar Cabral was trained as an agronomist in, uh, in Lisbon, in, in, the, uh, in the ISA, in the place where I, I show you the, the images of the soil uh, samples. And Cabral did his thesis on, on exactly on the erosion of, uh, of soil in Alentejo. And what, what I'm really, really inspired is by, by the methodology of Cabral. So there's a number of uh, annotated images uh, of, uh, of the destruction of soil. But in, in the captions, what Cabral is speaking of is speaking of uh, the erosion of soil, but is also speaking of the erosion of, uh, of the population. So he's speaking of the ec ecological, political destruction of the region of Alentejo as a whole. So in this sense, he's using more concepts which are akin to a political ecology. Uh, and not so much to uh, uh, so-called pure environmental uh, assessment, which would be closer to an idea of preservation uh, of landscape, but more to understand that the destruction made to the soil is a destruction made to the people and vice versa. So there's a, uh, they're, they're co-constituted in, uh, in a sense. So I'm, I'm, I'll read only one caption in Portuguese and then I'll attempt my best translation to English. So, era Cherneke. A vegetação destruída, solo destruído, material originário em destruição. Ferida aberta no corpo da terra, no corpo social da estrutura económica que realizou esta obra. So, uh, it's the destroyed vegetation, the destroyed soil, uh, the originary matter in destruction. So that speaks of erosion of, uh, uh, the, of the geological matter of soil. And then he says it's the open wound in the body of, of the land in the social uh, uh, body of, this, of the economic structure that realized, that made this, uh, this work. So to understand, uh, I think very similar to what you were saying at the end of your talk, that this land, the, this, the landscape of Alentejo, which is very famous uh, as a type of uh, particular ecosystem, which is montado, is a human-made landscape. It's a low, uh, a low intensity uh, human, uh, uh, ecosystem which requires uh, a, a particular type of maintenance, but it's, it has a very low uh, density and presence. And for, for that, it's also extremely uh, uh, sustainable. So the type of cultivation, which is the cork tree, the olive tree, and so on, I will not get into the, the, the details of, of Montado, but it, it, it does not require, for, of, on, on one hand, it does not require irrigation uh, or any type of, uh, uh, of chemicals, which is what is being increasingly uh, promoted and advocated uh, in the region. So I'm looking at this idea of uh, uh, what, what does it mean to have a liquid desert, which is a condition where, where we must consider a futurity, the futurity of the desert through the present image of water. So this is uh, the difficulty of the equation, but also trying to understand how you can mobilize uh, some of these uh, 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 discourses and, and some, some of the potentially the kind of future, future fictions of, uh, of disaster into the current uh, struggles uh, in the land. So that's an image of uh, 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 a field prepared for, for the cultivation of an intensive uh, olive uh, orchard. So you can see the, uh, how it becomes an, an entire infrastructure of chemicals and water. Uh, whereby, I mean, it's, it's not difficult to, to, to understand now the, the top layer of the soil, which is basically where you have most of the organic life, what sustains uh, soil uh, as an ecosystem, as a form of life, is basically destroyed when preparing for intensive cultivation. And uh, to understand also uh, how different forms of uh, 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 different practices, which, which are, could, be, could be called uh, traditional, but are, there, it, there's nothing really traditional about basically having a small-scale uh, uh, farm, apart from the fact that you're not, m most, of, most of the, the farmers would, would refuse the use of, uh, uh, of chemicals, they would, they, would, they would have different knowledge of the territory, of the seasons, of the world, so on and so on. So all these knowledges are basically being replaced by a form uh, which prioritizes uh, profit, uh, and, it's, and it's basically actually quite different uh, from the, this, this, the, what I showed you at the beginning, the settler colonial project, which had uh, thought of uh, uh, the family and, and the use of land as, uh, as a way of um, uh, occupying distributing populations. 
in the current uh, uh, in the current uh, uh, state of uh, of affairs, where you have the with intensive cultivation, you have a different uh, mode of economic exploitation, which is really neoliberal and does not require people. So this is quite an important transformation. People are not really uh, necessary, and when people are used, they are used in the most precarious. Uh, uh, forms so total, totally precarious labor, which we've seen uh, with with the recent uh, uh, um, I don't even know what to call it. So the kind of public awareness because of COVID uh, in uh, in the region of uh, Odmira. So suddenly uh, the uh, the country realized that th there were a, a large number of uh, uh, of uh, workers being exploited in in miserable conditions. Uh, Many of them being uh, trafficked, trafficked as, uh, as human labor, without any sort of protection, and also really exposed to the to the toxic consequences of intensive farming. So, in, uh, two images: one on, on heritage. So, these are actually um, uh, covers for uh, a, a journal that I'm I'm working with uh, with the movement. So, we're we're producing a journal, a physical journal that will collect. Um, information uh, uh, on the debate uh, and also uh, interviews and so on and so on according to kind of different topics uh, uh, that composes uh, uh, political ecology of, uh, uh, of the struggle against intensive farming. So here, the, the manifesto, this is really small, so I apologize uh, for that. On, so this manifesto is going to be printed in the, in the journal, but it basically tackles uh, a number of, uh, of issues that range from uh, uh, the, the health conditions, the toxicity, uh, erosion of soils, what happens with the irrigation, uh, labor, uh, the conditions of labor, the production of laborers. So it's really, uh, it's, it's really broad, but also the movement is composed by a very broad range of uh, uh, of knowledges, so there it's not it's not really an academic. Uh, I, I might be one of the few academic uh, 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 practitioners in the movement, but there's there it also includes uh, people that are connected to labor struggles, uh, scientists, biologists, uh, farmers, and so on and so on. It's, so it's it's really what I think Stengers calls it the ecology of practices, which is for me really inspiring. Uh, concept and what it tries is kind of to bring different voices and knowledges uh, into uh, forming a new collective body of knowledge uh, that would be useful for resisting uh, intensive cultivation. So this is uh, an invitation for uh, we, we hold a series of talks uh, every three four weeks. Now we're resuming the talks after after confinement uh, from COVID. Uh, so these are presential talks, and we have talks in different uh, areas in Alentejo. According, uh, so we, we organize the talks around the themes of the manifesto. So the next one is on precisely on the on water and intensive farming. So you're all invited to join us in Amieira Portel uh, on the 19th of June. And I'll thank you, and I'll finish here. Thank you. I want to thank the speakers. I know we're running a little bit of time, but as this is a forum where we want to engage in deeper discussion, I allowed that to run. And I apologize for all the technical difficulties on the beginning and the children's sounds, but I hope we could focus. And um, I want to have kind of an open conversation. So I'm inviting like all members from the panels to interact, because I think there are issues related with uh, energy resources and hydropolitics that could touch different forms of how we're looking at territorial planning. Even though it's different geographies, sometimes we have affinities in the struggles. And I will also invite the members of the collective, yeah, Moelem is here with us, to join us with the question. Um, maybe I will start and I will join two questions and also invite the audience, whoever wants to speak, just make a sign and I will enroll people. So I will ask with questions for Boa and Joana. And um, for Boaventura, I really appreciate that you bring in the situation in Cap Delgado because it's been really pressing. Uh, also, through Portuguese press, Esquerda.net has been publishing extensively about it. And the same companies that wanted to have uh, concessions for fracking and oil in Portugal, Galp, are operating also in Cap Delgado or planning to. Um, so I'm interested, because of your background as a journalist and somebody operating in the ground, what kind of activist coalitions between different movements uh, have emerged and what kind of memories of the struggle have passed throughout generations and practices? 
because this is something that I'm really uh, yeah, interested in. And then for Joanna, maybe I bridged two questions, so we just keep going. I really enjoyed how you brought up um, how epistemological disputes form uh, forms of environmental consciousness and how language is operating in such different manners in a very top-down view, but also how orality can be brought in. And so I would like to ask to you, because you've been in the field and you've operated on different levels, um, what kind of forms of, um, of working and of kind of accountability that you see that orality is being included, uh, like oral tradition, and the testimonies of people from the ground are being included or could be included for future practices in the kind of conservation policies that we're trying to, to address. So, because it seems so interesting how you bring that, that change of narrative can bring, uh, yeah, changes on, on the discourse. So I would be curious to see how you foresee. But maybe we start with Boa, who has been with us for a little while, and then we keep going. Margarita, I will ask you to um, to repeat your question, especially the first part of it. Uh, it was not it was not it was not clear to to me. Okay, but can you hear as well the sounds? Perfect. I wanted to ask you about activist coalitions in Cabo Delgado and beyond, because there seems to be a lot of memory from struggles, present and past, that can be in conversation. Knowing as well that the companies that are operating in Cabo Delgado are also operating in other countries, for example, here in Portugal. So because of your activist background and work on the ground. So here a little bit from activist memory. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, there is, there is a, a lot going on and there are um, uh, a number of um, coalitions that uh, emerged uh, others that were, were there before uh, that try to understand what is happening in Cabo Delgado, not from um, its, um, you know, the most uh, mediatized um, form, right? Because, I mean, the media tends to show it as a sort of Islamic uh, insurgency and uh, activist coalitions are, sh are saying that this is a resource conflict and it was uh, the concessioning of you know, gas reserves that have been, uh, that, that have triggered the, the you know, the, the armed conflict um, that end up, you know, being um, a new humanitarian crisis. And, you know, but this area in Cap Delgado particularly is a very um, interesting area in the sense that it was where the liberation struggle started uh, in the 1960s. So there is actually, a, mem a colonial memory as well of, uh, of, 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 of fighting against oppression and occupation and colonialism that I think it's very fresh today mm -hmm. as well. Um, uh, but other thing that is very important to uh, um, uh, remind is that, uh, you know, the current leadership of the country, right, in the name of the president is also from there and is part of one of the ethnic groups that uh, you know, uh, started the anti-colonial wars, uh, that today uh, being part of the national elite uh, is kind of, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, forgot, forgot about uh, um, uh, the people uh, with whom they struggled, right, to expel uh, colonialists. So it's, it's kind of a very complex um, um, case, a very complex area. And um, of course, also a very complex um, um, conflict. Uh, but but you know, if I if I if I give you example of uh, uh, activist co uh, coalitions and organizations that are working there, um, where for instance, Justice Ambiental, which is part of Friend, Friends of the Earth International, um, that also um, exposed the abuses. Uh, of uh, you know, you know, multinational corporations that are interested in, 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 in oil and gas, including Portuguese corporations such as Gulf uh, and uh, in other sectors, uh, Port Cell. Um, so, um, so yeah. So I mean, what is happening in Cap Delgado to me is a second dispossession of local people, mm -hmm. uh, being the first one, uh, the colonial process. Thank you. And uh, Molemo, if you want to jump in at a certain point, just make a sign. Okay. Yeah. Joana. 
will ask you the same. If you can repeat your question. <laughs> yeah, so my question had to do with how do you see that um, orality and the testimonies from the ground, from the communities that you work with, are or could be uh, included in the kind of conver uh, conversations about uh, conservation and the different politics from the ground. So, because there's a, language plays a big role here, you know, yes. uh, as you've introduced. So, well, I think it should play a role, especially when you see how much ecological knowledge and knowledge of the changing dynamics the, those um, testimonies carry and, and reveal. But w through the current um, management of the park, very informal since the 80s until now, there has been no efforts. It's, it's the story. I, so, well, I think there, there should be a role. Uh, not necessarily, well, it shouldn't be instrumentalized and look at this like, oh, they've planted seed, let's do the same in a scientific way. Um, but unfortunately, that's how it's happening. But, but yeah, the, the, my experience and the, the local experience is that this is not valued and also the fact that the people feel um, that they have to, to, to to accept this narrative and actually use it with, uh, with people who are external to the area just makes it difficult to realize, wow, there's a whole lot of, there's actually real conservation practices that people are doing. Um, and this is a very researched area, like decades of scientific, um, of you know, biology and, and social sciences, but kind of always focusing on the same, on the forest and what people think of the forest and what people do in the forest, and everything else is not being valued. So should it be part of the conversations? Yes, but I have not seen a forum. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would depend on precisely on respecting people and bringing them you know, more equal ways of doing research where jumping into a village and just conducting interviews, even if it's long term, won't reach. Uh, and I never expected that just using photography would actually bring something so different from what I had read and experienced until now. So some forms, some forms of participatory research might be able to, 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 to expose those bodies of knowledges and those um, and make people comfortable to, to speak, to say, say those things just the way it happened. But actually, just as an anecdote, the initial reaction to my project was negative. You know, oh, one more project. Women were forced by their husbands to take part of it. Um, one of the photographers told me, well, I thought you were obsessed by the forest as well. But actually, you're not. <laughs> and so I think a change in research methods and how you approach people with more respect uh, would be a good, a good start for, for, um, for uh, including those, uh, the wealth of knowledge into mm -hmm. actually conservation policies mm -hmm. in a way that is not artificial or instrumentalized. <laughs> I bring Jean into conversation because I know you also work with the, the photographic method, although in a different way, but <laughs> the idea of testimony is very important and now being more connected also to the territory of Valentejo, which can connect very interestingly to the next panel that also talks about hydro resources and how they're so connected with extractivism. Um, I wanted you to bring a little bit about this methodological side of being back on the fields and... Yeah. yeah. You are here. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we started, so I, I, I forgot totally to say the, the, the pictures, most of the images I showed from Alentejo are, are by a photographer called Yanis Dracolidis, uh, a friend, a collaborator, and we, we, did, we did field work uh, to collect these images already three years ago, and they're the first part of a longer project whereby the image would be also uh, considered in time, so the idea is to, to have a series of images, so to reproduce images in kind of different Across, across the years, so you basically you have a sense, a temporal sense of the transformations. So there was, that, that was kind of the aesthetical drive, or an idea of like trying to produce an image of, uh, uh, of soil that would basically capture kind of these different components, how, how soil affects uh, the, the different modes of life that exist in the territory. And also I was interested that that, that image would be not, not taken by me or, or, or by a local, uh, but that would be actually really, for me it was really interesting to bring an external eye, a trained photographer, to look at the territory from the outside and, and that would produce kind of a new, um, 
a new aesthetic sensitivity uh, of what is, what is taking place. What was interesting methodolo methodologically uh, during the work is that that allowed for kind of different types of contact uh, with populations. So it, it allowed for conversations that wouldn't happen. Or pe some people were really happy to be photo. So they thought of it as posing for a, f a photographer, be also because we were using uh, uh, analog uh, photography, so it was a proper proper fil film camera, and that, that somehow also created, for me it was interesting to think of the kind of a slower time, in, in, so it really, it's, it's film, so it develops, so there's also a relation of that with the time of soil, slowing down the time of soil, which I think is, is for me part of uh, the, the, the ways that you, you can think of how can we resist intensification of intensive agriculture, you need to slow down. Right, so you need to kind of reduce the intensity of, of, of everything. And the phot photography was interesting for that, in a sense. It's an unfinished project, so I hope there will be further developments in that. And I enjoyed how you introduced how um, forms of cartography and territorial planning were redefining the soil-water uh, relation, but also the relation of people's habits, their occupation of territory, and labor, which we've seen, as you briefly mentioned, on the recent uh, news on the intensive agriculture. I wanted you to bring a little bit more the labor uh, kind of. Yeah, so the, the, labor, the labor aspect. So it's one, one of uh, uh, kind of the group, group, work, group works of, of the movement is to, to think of labor, uh, uh, labor practices in all its dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, so both from the, the, the notion of like small scale farming, which exists in Alentejo, large, medium sized farms, even large scale farms. But considering what, what is happening now, which is kind of the exploitation of, uh, mm -hmm. of labor, mainly migrant uh, labor um, in large uh, uh, plantations, and the way that these, uh, uh, these workers are, in, in most cases, uh, arriving here, uh, running away from, uh, uh, from, from other conditions of, uh, of exploitation and soil exhaustion. For example, the workers that come from India uh, they, are, they are already the aftermath of decades of exploitation uh, as a consequence of the Green Revolution, right? The main source being, uh, if, if you want to read more about this in India, it's uh, Shiva, Vandana Shiva, uh, writes about this since the 90s, and she's basically describing from the very beginning uh, how, so already the aftermath of one or two decades of, uh, of the politics of Green Revolution, so this, the seed fertilizer package, so genetically modified seeds uh, that, uh, that are resistant to, to particular chemicals. So basically when you apply this combination, uh, that's the only thing that, that lives, right? So it basically kills everything else. That's the GMO, Monsanto, so on, debacle. And the consequences of that, so what, what happened in India uh, uh, is that you have the first years of kind of an increase uh, uh, um, of yield, of, uh, of cultivation, and after a few years, the soil becomes exhausted and requires further increase of chemicals uh, and fertilizers to, to be productive. And because the cultivation is attached to microcredits given to small farmers, uh, they end up very, very uh, soon, in, in a few years, uh, in debt. Mm -hmm. So they need to, uh, um, and because they have, they have these debts from microcredit, they need to sell their farms, mm -hmm. and they lose the only thing that they have, which is their land. So the workers, so the, the story goes that the workers that arrive here, the new precarious labor in Alentejo, which is kind of uh, uh, taking part in, in a phenomenon which is the increase of the size of exploitations and, and the uprooting of local populations in Alentejo, they're already being uprooted from somewhere else. And they're arriving in the present from the consequences of, of the Green Revolution. So it's a really multi-temporal uh, dispossession and uprooting, uh, which is a consequence of intensive farming. Mm -hmm. So this, I'm, I'm trying to connect that in the risk, but also to bring these stories, that this is what the movement is always try, trying to do, is to bring these stories of dispossession and uprooting that are basically traveling across geographies and across time. So this is really, I, th I think, really hard for people to understand, maybe, and to get away from the narrative of, um, which I really hate, of mig the idea of migrant labor, so the way that people suddenly are, are, are being labeled as, as migrants. And not, it's not that they're not migrants, that they don't arrive here from migration, but it's the fact that this somehow uh, takes away from them the, the, uh, their, the, the rights that they have as, as workers. Mm -hmm. If they work here, if they work in ports, they're workers, and they should be protected by the same worker laws. 
that protect Portuguese uh, workers. So there's a whole political, for me, really, uh, uh, the political project of, of, of naming workers as migrants, mm -hmm. right? Which is basically also another form of, of dispossession, which is taking place. Which uh, very interestingly ties into the, the reason why I wanted to do this session, which has to do with be as an activist on mining, being really frustrated with the kind of uh, discourse that is going, which is very divided in between the fields of action and the very in my backyard kind of situation. Um, and I, I think that it's very important that we start addressing environmental problems, of course, as racial issues, but also as uh, class issues. And the debates in terms of different movements really has to come from new coalitions and you know having more kind of open discursive forums. I would like to open the space for questions either from Mo or the audience or other panelists or even between the panelists in the panel. Whoever wants to, the collective, whoever wants to contribute, just raise a hand. Okay, we have somebody in the audience and we have Molemo. I will take Molemo and then Sofia. I'll take both and then we answer too. Thanks, Margarita. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, thank you to everybody. I, I, I'm really struck by a kind of connection between the three talks around um, these kind of historical but also contemporary narratives of dispossession and a need to, to really reframe these narratives around, I suppose, both agricultural and ecological development, whether it be under the guise of conservation or, or, or the large-scale agricultural programs. And, and by this kind of resistance, whether it be this, this active resistance against the Pro Savannah project or in these kind of revised narratives that Joanna spoke about, um, and, and this kind of need to really uh, reframe and redefine. Um, I, I was very struck by, as well, your, your personal memory of these dams, and I, I certainly personally kind of uh, relate to this having to, to reframe um, in our own minds these historical narratives of development that. Um, need to be shifted. My question, and maybe I address this to, to Boaventura, but, but others might be interested to respond too, would be kind of what, in this reframing, what are the imaginaries of a, a potential alternative future of, of something like a pro savannah should be? Um, and and where, where do those alternative imaginaries situate their knowledge? What are, sort of where do they emerge from um, would be my interest. Thanks. And I'll take Sophia's question, and then we can answer. Hi, hello. Um, I confess that I only I did, I missed the first two um, interventions, mm -hmm. so maybe what I'm saying is limited or a bit superficial. So I'm talking from a general public point of view, yeah. And it's like with the idea that we need to engage the general public more and really fast, all of us, you know, also individually. And I can't, she told me not to take them off. <laughs> um, so and I've heard uh, several times throughout the um, presentations, this um, is really complex, is really complex, this is a really complex situation is really complex. Well, I think that might put people off <laughs> trying to engage, yeah? And I just want to say that complexity is part of life. The modern life is really complex. Globalization is immensely complex, but we have been accustomed to navigate complexity. And that's one of the things that needs to be kind of, I think, worked, is to unblock people's action because of complexity, yeah. So we need to welcome complexity. We're fully capable of dealing with it, as we have done for quite a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Boventura, do you want to answer and then I'll open? Yes, I will, I will answer Molemo. Um, yeah, one of the strongest elements of the um, of the you know resistance pros, resistance against pro savanna was that um, the movement was also putting forward what should be the, the rural future and the agrarian future for Mozambique, and uh, you know 
by and large, they share, um, you know, perspectives that are generally shared um, by um, other agrarian movements around the global south. Um, proposals such as, you know, agroecology or food sovereignty, um, decentralizing food system and localizing food systems, which means, um, you know, working with local knowledges and uh, basically challenge the corporate driven uh, uh, sort of uh, food system and regime. Um, so of course, I mean, what does it mean to build food sovereignty in Mozambique? It's a big discussion, uh, but I think there are elements, um, uh, there are, you know, preconditions for um, a popular or a people's driven uh, agrarian system uh, to, um, to, to work in Mozambique. I mean, I, 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 I work in South Africa and I can see the difference in the agrarian structures between both countries. Uh, in South Africa, it's much more difficult because the agricultural sector is highly dominated by you know, corporate capitalist agriculture. In Mozambique, is still dominated by peasant agriculture, right? So the conditions for uh, you know, agrarian decentralization is there because people have access to land, right? And you have a system that allow people to you know, produce food in smaller you know, sort of um, uh, ways. Um, and you know, we, we, I mean, the, 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 resistant, the movement that was resisting Pro Savannah was saying that we do not need, you know, large scale intensive agriculture because, you know, um, apart from that provoking ecological crisis also threaten livelihoods. Uh, it, it increases uh, the crisis of social reproduction and it expels the peasantry, you know, those who cannot be um, given jobs by, you know, by the corporate agriculture will end up being uh, poorer, right? So the, the future is, uh, you know, agroecology, food sovereignty, which are proposals that will have to, I mean, need to be, you know, uh, put, put in perspective and see how they can be, they can work in, in the context of Mozambique. Um, Sophia, I, really, I did not uh, uh, follow your question uh, or your comment. It was very difficult for me to, to, to hear you, but uh, if, you, if it, the question was directed to me, I'll invite you to repeat it. If not, leave it <laughs> like that. Uh, well, I think it was a general comment for the panel, but Sophia just saw the last presentation. I wanted to ask if somebody wants to address that, otherwise we'll take some more questions. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I will take Alper's question. I would like to say, I forgot, if anybody wants to make a question in Portuguese, I am happy to translate as well. Mm -hmm. I forgot to say that. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll keep on in English. Um, I think um, um, one of the issues I think that also um, Sophia was, was bringing up is this issue of a systemic view that is needed really to look into all these different layers um, that have been touched upon uh, this afternoon. And I think for, for I, I'm just going to pick one example, um, João was saying about the difficulty in calling these uh, workers in the fields as migrants, they've been called migrants. I think they're not migrants, they are economic refugees. Mm -hmm. They are running away from an economic system, a globalized economic system that is destroying uh, human livelihoods for many decades now and I think this is one of the big elephants in the room, mm -hmm. which is the globalized economic and financial mo model mm -hmm. that is been, um, um, from which very few are profiting from, mm -hmm. and it's been ruining both the planet in terms of environment and also socially. Mm -hmm. I'm talking from a perspective of a citizen, but also I'm involved in a movement that is called degrowth, and degrowth promotes a vision, a systemic vision of the whole system connecting the economic, the social, um, and um, also the individual uh, choices in terms of lifestyle. And I think, yes, we've been profiting from having 
better lifestyles in the urbanized Western world and in some of, in parts of the rest of the world, but unfortunately, in the long run, and what we are seeing already is that the, one of the consequences is, for instance, this case of uh, people who are taken away from their own territories because uh, of the impact of this uh, globalized economic system. Thank you. Uh, any of the speakers wants to react to the comments of Aldur? Please, yeah. Uh, following up, yes. Following up a little bit on res resistance, I've always been. Oops. <laughs> struck how in Cantonese National Park there doesn't seem to be resistance um, but it might be also just a problem with my field work depending on where I spent more time um, but I was always struck by how farmers would try to play the system and use for their use the system of development and conservation for political reasons but not really openly resisting and organizing mm -hmm. against those interventions mm -hmm at all, so it's a I guess open question. geographies and different temporalities yeah. come to terms with different yeah. forms of resistance. Still an open question for me, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a comment on yes. that. Yes. Please, Bovin. And my comment was that, I mean, like, um, it has been, I mean, at, at least within uh, critical agrarian studies, um, it has been researched uh, uh, you know, the ways in which people express their uh, grievances and the way in which they um, sort of, you know, not, not always we, we are going to see explosive direct actions of what we can call resistance. It doesn't mean that people are not, uh, you know, they, they, they resist in covert ways or they, you know, using sabotage or, you, you know, there are many other forms of, uh, of uh, so I wouldn't, um, I think for me, the, the word resistance and the concept is very key, Joana. Um, I think it's just that the lens we use, the lens we use to determine whether, you know, th th there is kind of, you know, it's that sometimes feels like people are just giving up, right? And they're just uh, being absorbed within oppressive forces. But I think that if we look at it in a more uh, nuanced way, um, we can, you know, find, um, forms of resistance that are not always overt. I think we will uh, take these comments to have a little break and we'll have a 10 minute break and then come back for the second panel. I thank everybody for sticking around this such hot day. There's some refreshments and thank you Bovin Tudor for joining us.